This conference will now be recorded. Okay, it's now 10 o'clock and I'll call this town council workshop meeting to order. Uh, first thing on the, on the workshop item, the first thing is a discussion about the Surfside Beach Pier. And uh, Mr. Shanahan, do you want to... Excuse me. Just so you all know, you have to put this in your face, otherwise nobody hears you. Uh, we are here, I mean, there's a couple of issues going on with the pier, but the, the issue that we're here today is for the electricity. We want to talk about what needs to be at the bottom of, of the pier, and then once we've identified what needs to be at the bottom of the pier, if it is different than what we've got in the plans and everything, we need to get the council to approve it so we can do whatever we come up with if that makes sense and just to clarify when you talk about the bottom of the pier you're talking about I'm, the end of the pier all the way out yes yeah, so that's the liverpool in me i'm sorry bottom to me is always the end i'm sorry <laughs> um so with that if y'all wouldn't mind <clears throat> i'll just let them explain what they've come up with with the pier and then we'll take it from there if that's okay sure cool yeah, you want to run it? Um, I did create just a sample to kind of look at. Sorry. I only printed out a few copies, so we'll have to share. Um, because power is calculated differently, whether it's single phase, what the voltage is, if it's three phase, um, I think that's where a lot of misunderstandings. Are happening. Can I, can I ask who you are? My name is Lisa Sandman. I'm sorry. I'm Lisa Sandman, electrical engineer. I work with RMF Engineering. Um, I did the original design on the project. Um, it's been since 2017 that we started on all this. and You got to talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I said the people can't hear you. <laughs> It's been uh, since 2017 when we started on it. What does that mean? Get closer. Get closer. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> um, it, we have gone, you know, around and around on what we want on the end of the pier. And so in our last meeting, we kind of discussed a few things. And I thought it would be easier if I talked with everybody in person. So I created this list of possible loads that would be down at the end of the pier. Because um, what I'm trying to do, if we want 400 amps, I'm all for it. I will do it. I just, I think I'm doing a disservice if I don't explain how that is probably excessive for what we want to do. Um, there's very limited square footage down there. We cannot build a building down there. So pretty much what we have is going to be open air. So what I did here is because I'm guessing and we don't know exactly what's going to be down there. I made a list of what could possibly be there. Um, so with band equipment and bar cooler equipment, I know a lot of things always say dedicated circuit, but load wise, those are really not dedicated circuits. Like a typical beer cooler is anywhere between five to eight amps, which you could put a couple on a circuit. Um, a POS machine, I mean a point of service machine, and that's what a lot of the kiosk and stuff that they want for their things, very minimal. Those are like a single amp. So even though it says 15 amps when you're looking at cut sheets. So that's why I did this up to look at what the total load would be. So when I do the loads and what I've already put together, I am calculating, if you look down on there, says 59.5 I'm calculating 59.5 amps at the end of the pier and that's at a 208 volt single phase that would suffice for a band and bar equipment and what I was proposing is taking 100 amps so we have a little bit of spare capacity now that load is based on everything being on all at the same time and that's saying, okay, if you have an enclosed section two, I add an HVAC mini split. So we're saying everything's on, which it's not. So it's a pretty conservative calculation. 
Then what I did is I know we've talked about kiosks and such. I don't know if those kiosks are at the end of the pier, along the pier, under the pier. Um, but I just added those as a load. Those typical units, it's like some lights, maybe some charging, and again, a POS station. So I, being conservative, I put a load in of eight amps and said eight kiosks. And we're still sitting at, if you look down a little lower, it says 96.5 amps. So that still is not anywhere near a 400 amp service. If there's other things that I'm unaware of, I mean, like I said, most certainly we can do a 400 amp service, but it will be quite expensive because I do not have the spare capacity in what has already been brought to the main electrical room on the pier. I only have calculated 26.6 kVA, which is about 150 amps. So that's what I was working within so that we don't have to bring another service or another conductor onto the pier from the transformer <coughs> that's down at grade. My estimates, if we had to do that, is going to probably be anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for them to do all that added work. So, and that's just a guess. So just keep that in mind, and that's why I'm trying to guide to what it sounds like that you actually need. Um, and again, if there's something not listed on here, yeah, please speak up. Um, but that's where I'm coming from. And so my proposal is to put 100 amps at the end of the pier. If those kiosks are along the pier, we do have general purpose receptacles. There's three circuits along the pier that can be plugged into. And it would probably satisfy all your needs for any kind of future that would go on along there. Because, I mean, like you say, LEDs, the loads seem to get lighter and lighter. We're at the end of the period, we're really not going to have HVAC down there because, I mean, who wants to close up and you're sitting down there at the end of the pier? It's going to be all open. So the worst load is probably the ice machines. And I have an ice machine sitting on here of what that load is, too. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody has any questions for me of what I'm looking at. Can I ask a question? Sure. You said that you... I'm sorry, you said that... <laughs> we could actually up it to 150 if we did that would there be additional costs uh, well the additional costs for any of this is going to be taking the extra feeder and the panel and um any other receptacles that'll be at the end of the pier but it's not going to be to the tune of coming all the way from the transformer and up to the pier so we could go with that 150 just so we have you could cap, cap it yeah we could go with everything spare on that panel if you like. Okay. But I would add, uh, Troy Rame, LS3C architect, I would add that if you take all the additional um, capacity from the main panel, then that would be your entirety of your main, of your additional capacity from the main panel. So if you ever wanted to do anything from the house panel at that point at a later time, then you would have already given all that amperage and power to the end of the pier and you wouldn't have it for the house panel. In, in a way, it's, it's, it's kind of shared. So even if we did have 150 down there, it doesn't all have to be used. It's just the calculation is going to show that it is used. Because once everything is moving and every, you get your bill at the end, of every month you'll have a power consumption that you use a lot of times that bill is only going to show like 50 percent of what is actually calculated and that's because not all the loads are on at the same time so i have to do my calculations and what i serve in equipment for that calculation but the utility company is going to show something a little different and when that happens you can say oh i have this existing gear and i can add more but that you can't do until there's a history. So, and that's usually a year later before you know what's being used. And I know that's a little, probably a little bit more deeper than you have to. It's just that 
a year from now and you guys say, oh, well, I really did have capacity. Well, yes, you do, but I can't do it that way. I have to go by calculations. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Um, if we look to the future, you know, because this is beyond what we're envisioning today, you know, the rules change, the laws change, demographics change, you know, desirability of, of different things change. So if we look out to thinking that a structure could be built there, what, what would be the additional load for HVAC? I mean, is that a significant add that, that we're into, you know, a I, real I, issue later? Probably not, because like somebody brought up on the meeting, at your house you have a 100 amp service at your house. That structure is not going to be the size of a house. Right, right. So, and if that structure's there, you're not going to have room really for a band, or the band's going to be inside the structure. So, it's either going to be either or. Right. So, so I do not see it being any kind of issue have needing more power down there. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, I got a question for you, ma'am. You got the kiosks at eight at eight amps, correct? Yeah, that's just an estimate. On the kiosks, how many kiosks are y'all looking at along the pier? And quite a few. And then how many are we going to sell yogurt? How many are we going to sell something that has to be refrigerated? That's what I was concerned about. So probably a kiosk is going to have a little under-counter refrigerator in there or maybe even one of the countertop high refrigerators. Those are like three amps, if that, two and a half, three amps. And it's being shared by the end of the pier, correct? The voltage starts at the front of the pier and runs back to the end of the pier for that part? Or is it separate circuit, separate circuit directed for going down the pier? You mean as far as meter-wise? No, or? It's, it's all on the same circuit, in other words. Coming would, into it, the 200 amp on, service going out. Correct. They're going to piggy some they'll, of that. They'll plug in and they'll piggy back on to how that... What's Power going? is distributed, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm Robert Krause. I'm the chairman of the peer committee. And um, I guess we were assuming that there's two 400 amp panels. That's what we've heard. Is that correct? Today? Well, we were just using those as an example of what a 400 amp panel can serve. Technically, what's brought to the um, peer itself is a 1200 amp service. And that's at three days. Um, from that, I had five meters, and each meter is going to the separate retail buildings, and then we have a single house panel. So our house panel is serving all the public loads, everything you know along that pier, including the elevator, um, the bathrooms, and all that. And that is a 400 amp panel. And then the restaurant also has a 400 amp panel and which is you know how a restaurant has all kinds of electric cooling and cooking and everything else so that's a, a huge load and then all the retail spaces i put in a 200 amp panel but most likely they're only going to use 60 amps i mean they just don't have there it, there's just not enough that they would plug in like a kitchen would well, there is another kitchen proposal yeah, not necessarily as large as the building A, but that's going to be under 200? I'm sorry, the question? There, there's a proposal for another kitchen, another Oh, in one place. of the retail spaces? Yes. Yes, that's already been as a average load. There's a 200 amp panel in each of those spaces that right now there's nothing connected to that that kitchen would come off of. So all of, already that's planned for in the loads. So, so if we've got the one big restaurant at about using all the way up to 400 and the smaller one using all the way to 200. Okay, so that big restaurant, they got a 400 amp panel. I haven't seen their final loads. They're probably sitting around 280, 300 amps. Okay. That there's diversity in that. So when they get their bill every month, they're probably using maybe 200 amps of that 400, but it, they have to be on a 400 amp panel. So it's, it, you have to plan for worst case, but generally it's not. So 
that panel it's on its own then your other kitchen is probably a smaller kitchen they're going to have that 200 amp panel they're going to probably be sitting a whole lot less than that but they have 200 amps available off of that 1200 amp service so it's just, it's just how that service is broken down and given to each retail space so the next retail might be closed like i said they're only going to have hvac and some lights Okay, so like I'm, I'm sorry, John. I just want to finish that. At six o'clock on a 95 degree day, the air conditioners are blasting fully. The both kitchens are cooking their brains out. That's the worst the case. The elevators running up and down. And you got and there's power all planned for that. And that's so those are going to be your peak highs, and that's what we plan for. But in general, that's you know it's it averages just like your house. Right, but I mean, yeah, like you say, you got to account for the peaks. You got to account for it all. And, and just to the point we brought this up months ago because we went to Mount Pleasant and Folly Beach, and both of them said, "Whatever you do, get as much power to the end of the pier as you can." Okay, and that's where all this started. So right, and we did pull and we did pull Folly Beach drawings, and those are a 40 amp two pole at the end of the pier that they put planned for, and maybe they wanted more than that or they've got something planned for than that, I don't know. But what they actually have is 40 amps and well, not 400. They're telling us they don't have enough, or at least they haven't in the past. And yes. I don't, you know, that's, that's what started it all, so. Okay. So John. John Hyatt, um, when you say a 200 amp panel, is that the what the panel can handle or what load actually goes to the panel? <laughs> so, now, so now we're getting into other, things of how equipment is rated. When I say a 200 amp panel, it's actually only 80% of that. And that's how circuit breakers are tested and work out. So really it's only 160 amps. But what it's saying is 160 amps of continuous load, meaning that load is on all the time. And so that makes it so the equipment is able to handle 200 amps under instantaneous conditions. So when a motor turns on, so if it's a 10 amp motor, when that turns on, it's actually drawing like 60 amps. It's usually six times. And so you're gonna get these peaks of every time something turns on, but the equipment itself is rated to handle those kind of loads. So that's why they say you can only load it up to 80 amps because it's keeping that 20 amps for all those things going on and off. Just like when you turn your vacuum cleaner on and your lights dim in a house, they connect your receptacle to the lights. We don't do that commercially, but that's when you see those kind of things happen because now it probably just drew 25 amps on a 20 amp breaker and then it came right back down again and everything's fine. That stuff, the equipment's rated for that. What's available at the end of the pier by design right now? What's at the end of the year by design right now? Um, I was told, because we asked this question back then if they wanted anything, and they said, no, we just need general purpose receptacles. So what I did is I have receptacles spaced all along the pier and around the shelter, and is sharing three circuits right now. For how many amps? So those three circuits would be 16 times three, because they're 20 amp circuits, but we really can only load them to 16. So what is that for? 40, 40, yeah. All right. So we need an estimate uh, of the cost and schedule impact of increasing that to 150 amps available across the pier itself. Okay. So what I would have to do is I can go ahead and get our drawings wrapped up to that 150 amps, and then I have to give it to the contractors. And then the contractors go and price that as a change order to their current pro project. And how quickly can we get that done? Um, that's, I don't know as far as that happens, how fast that happens. Well, I think I'll just speak that, that we've been working on this, and I know that Lisa's been working on her drawings. It's just a clear direction that we've needed in order to proceed. Well, but we need to know the impact before we make the decision to do it or not. So I think it's been clear for at least what I'm aware of the last three to four months that we are interested in looking to the future beyond what we said we wanted on the end of the pier as to what is it going to take to anticipate the future and get that additional power out there, you know, 
now rather than later. It'll, it'll be three times the cost if we try to do it later. So, but I think council needs to make the decision based on what's the impact to the project, what's the impact to the budget, and without doing that, there's no way we can vote to say yes or no, we want to do it. So I think we need the information, be prepared and cost it out, have the contractor tell us what's the potential impact to the schedule, and you know how much is it going to cost us to get 150 amps out at the end of the pier. Okay. So what Troy was saying is I've had emails going around 300 amps, 400 amps, and then you know all that. So now that I know that you guys are comfortable with my yeah. recommendation of the 100 amps or so, we 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 can we can you know ask the peer committee. They're the ones that are working you know closely with the vendors that we receive bids for. You know, are you guys comfortable that 150 will do what you have envisioned and give us a little leeway for the end of the pier. I mean, mm. I think today that's that's our critical decision point yeah. to get this moving and, and getting the decision made as quickly as possible. Well, it's kind of a quick, quick response, but I mean, this helps a whole lot. We've never heard all this detail and uh, it, it definitely under, well, I don't understand it. I was a mechanical engineer. I took my two electrical <laughs> classes. <laughs> it was many years ago too, but um, I, you know, it, it sounds reasonable. Um, now we do also have another uh, proposal we've been asking for not as long, but to put kiosks under the pier to have like retractables. And we, we know there may be other issues with that, you know, regulatory stuff, but you know, shop type things that can pull down to the, to the sand, you know, the mm -hmm. beach level, and then they can be retracted up at night. Would that throw a big monkey wrench into the plans too? So, I mean, number one, I, because we were told not to have power underneath the pier, we could only have lights and that was a FEMA requirement. So legally I can't put anything like that on my drawings. If, if you don't think you're going to have that much and it is just a retractable cord and it's all on your own, you could probably access the receptacles that are already out there on the pier, plug it in there and put whatever retractable cord you want there. Well, we were talking about a built-in one that's in the, you know, above the pier, I guess, or at the pier level that can be pulled down by the kiosk operator. When he opens I would up say on my drawings that it can't be pulled down just because my drawings have to comply with those requirements by FEMA. So I could put something on there can we? Can you tell us what those requirements are? They just—they said they did not want receptacle power, things you could plug in underneath the pier. But it would be above, but, pulled down. It, it wouldn't be below the pier. I mean, that's that's what we're proposing, like in a shop or the yes, all that stuff yes, up yes, at the yes. ceiling. And Mr. Mayor, it's kind of the same but thing. It's beneath the platform. It's, yeah, yeah, it, it would Mr. be Mayor. on. Yeah. Could we have? our town staff to address this. I think they've kind of looked into the underneath. Maybe they can address to what y'all y'all are asking instead of asking this lady. John or Sabrina. John or Sabrina, could y'all? No, it's going to be on fire marshal. Fire marshal, whoever can, yeah, can there you get go. in on this. Big <laughs> one. You're up. As far as the fire code goes, the fire code, um, the, the temporary wiring of, of having cords and drop cords is not going to be permitted by the state fire code to have uh, temporary wiring underneath the pier. Uh, it, it comes down to where uh, appliances need to be. They can be plugged into a surge strip, which has a, a um, breaker device built into it. But when you start using drop cords and having things connected into drop cords and ran, that is where that it becomes an issue of the, thank you, sir, um, <laughs> of, of where it does become an issue. And, and certainly, folks, when we start looking and having drop cords, We've got a corrosive, a very, very corrosive atmosphere to start with, with the water. We've got certainly the water and, and the water being ran down and the, as the tide comes in and goes out, 
all of this is a concern with safety of, of having uh, power down there underneath the, uh, the pier with water and uh, corrosive atmosphere. Certainly the cords, the, the code does not permit those cords to be ran down and attached to the pier uh, with, with anything. It has to be uh, permanent wiring and then permanent wiring um, is, is not going to be permitted there and temporary wiring is going to be for 90 days only. So all of those are reasons as to why uh, electricity and power under the pier would be not recommended. You know, excuse me, it seems like um, you're maybe thinking that we want to put power under the pier all the way to the end of it. Uh, we don't. We're looking at putting power under the building portion of the pier, the pavilion portion of the pier only. Does your answer still hold to that? Sir, the, the code doesn't say whether it's over water or not. The, the, the same code would apply to this building here. As, as far as having power here, you can take a surge strip and plug into an outlet, but you can't plug surge strip into surge strip into surge strip um, because it, when you do that, you're, you're using that to overload that outlet. And with that, with that same thing being said, I can just see this as a situation of, of where if there's power down there and even beach goers realize that they're going to come over there with, with, um, cell phone chargers or whatever else and they're going to they're going to want to plug things in there and that becomes an issue becomes a safety issue uh it, it becomes an issue of, of where we're we're over exceeding the, the power limitations and have the potential there with the environment um you know we're, we're talking about the code in a building here that that um, has no corrosive atmosphere it it has no uh, water involvement, but we're going underneath a pier where there is water. The tide does change. The tide does fluctuate. And so I do not feel like that it would be safe to have power under there, portable power that uh, is, is changed by the fluctuation of the tide. Well, there's no tide that reaches the under the pavilion on a regular basis. It's, if we go down to the beach now, we all see that it stops far short of it. Two, we already are going to have lights under the pier, so there's already power under the pier. All we're asking for is to run another circuit that that uh, retractable uh, cords can be lowered down and shared by the kiosk and then replaced. The public wouldn't have access to them, and uh, they would retract back up every day after the kiosk left. If there's no kiosk there that day, they wouldn't be used. Um, so... I'm not sure that all of your answer would apply to that situation. Am I incorrect? So the lights are enclosed. The lights are enclosed and gasketed and protected from those elements and meant to be in a marine environment. The receptacle is open. The ends of it, the corrosion, as he keeps saying, is going to get into those contacts. You're going to plug in, plug out, and then you're still getting corrosion stuff into those contacts and it's an open circuit when you unplug it and there's power coming you can have arcs you can have all kinds of things happen you know when you pull something you get shocked it would probably be on a worst case situation because you're around water more corrosion than you expect it's not as safe as a hardwired light fixture that's all protected and everything's enclosed. I, I don't think we're talking the same thing. We're talking about a retractable outlet. So an outlet is protected, but you know it's built in and you retract that and it comes down. And when you kiosk, plug in, plugs in. When you plug in, those are contacts in there. Right. So when you take it and you plug it back in, you've got something that's uh, contacts are in that plug that's going to be outside in the elements. This, con this set of contacts, it's exposed. And, and is that it's different than... It's not enclosed and gasketed and protected from the elements well, the same way. So what about when somebody plugs into one of the outlets at, at the pier? The same salt Up air is top, there? You're not standing in water. Well, Possibility we're, we're talking, of standing on wet sand. You're, it's not the same thing. We're talking right under the buildings, basically. That We part. had receptacles on the drawings. FEMA made us take them off. Zane Peterson with Collins Engineers, and regarding the title thing as well, um, I could potentially go back and look at my observation reports that I've put in, 
Um, I do know on certain occurrences the tide has came as far as the actual podium of the pier. Whether it was a king tide or not, obviously, um, but that is the freak accident or the highest peak of that, and that's what the entire pier was designed off of, was the peak of everything. Um, so if we put something in there that FEMA has not approved or disapproved of, and the peak happens and something were to occur, then... I do believe the town would be responsible. Well, the first thing that would happen is all the kiosk people would get out of there because <laughs> their kiosks are getting swept into the sea. Yeah, so they'd unplug the reject. You know, our concern on. again with the plug-in being, even if it is closer to the podium, if a tide comes in and they don't have time to move all of their stuff at one time and unplug the cords and retract the cords and still save all of their stuff, then the town still would be, I assume, responsible <laughs> for one the awesome tide. That's that's that. Uh, Thailand thing, uh, the Michigan. tsunami. Yeah. I, I, I could go ago. back and That's look it. for the observation Mr. reports okay. with the time. Are they, Mr. Mayor, are they no, are they no plug-ins in the elevator shaft or nothing down on the ground floor? In the elevator shaft, I believe there is. Yes, there is. It's GM, what's, it's that's required by code. But what's for, can for, can you explain the difference? Because that elevator shaft, if it gets to where they're talking about. That elevator shaft's going to be underwater too. It's locked. It's not. Exposed. It ain't sealed. It will get water inside Correct. of it. Correct. It's it's locked from public use. It's. Uh, but your argument of what you were just saying I'm, is okay. I'm going by interpretation. I don't know a hundred percent why some codes are made and why they're not. It you get commentary as to this is why it developed. The code was all written about safety and fire hazard and shock <clears throat> prevention. And and usually some, so many cases of somebody getting hurt, then a code would come along. FEMA is a guideline um, and FEMA is the one that has distributed money that we have to follow their guidelines. And their guideline when we did one of our reviews was not to have the receptacles there. My interpretation of that was they have had issues with it, and this is something they didn't want to be liable for. They don't have... But FEMA did allow the sole electrical outlet in the elevator shaft. Well, but we can have any number of kiosks that don't need power. I mean, we have 50 or more of them in uh, Memorial Park twice a week. So, I mean, I don't know that that necessarily needs to be you know, something to hold up everything else right now. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing that, that it would be a good thing to be able to do that, but that also seems to be something that can be accessed at a later date should we get that clarification from FEMA and so forth, because, you know, it's reachable. It's only 10 feet above our heads, not, you know, out over 100 feet of water. Um, but we can also manage what kiosks we place under the podium to be those that may not necessarily need power. If they absolutely need power, maybe they're the ones we set up on the pier where they can plug in. If, if Mr. Mayor, if they have to have power to a certain degree, can they use those, one of them quiet little generators? Can they bring that to the... That, that, yeah, there you go. As as far as generator use underneath the pier, we've we've got a couple of concerns there. One of them is is the gasoline and the the water. We've we've got an environmental issue, a potential environmental issue there again with the water. If we have a spare gallon of gasoline that were to get turned over or putting filling up a generator uh, from that gasoline on a daily basis of where they're they're refilling and spilling gasoline there underneath the pier. There's certainly the environmental concern there um, is, is great. The other thing is going to be the noise of the generators that are, are going to be running. Um, so in my professional opinion, I, I do not think having generators with carbon monoxide, all the hazards that would be there be a potential. I don't think that that would be a, a, a wise choice in having those generators underneath the pier. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to go back to the end of the pier. Excuse me. I want to go back to the end of the pier. I met yesterday with the 
potential leasee for that space. And his electrical contractor says he needs 200 amps minimum out there. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But what do we do if that is what he needs? I mean, they it, actually, they it, because of certain reasons that we hadn't signed any contracts, we can't have him here. But that's who we should have been talking to is his contractor because he knows what the guy wants to do and told him what he, what he needed. So that's that's where the 200, 400 amps came from is we wanted to have enough power to give us flexibility at the end of the pier. So when you're planning, a, from my end, when you're planning a empty shell, vanilla box is what we call it, retail space, we don't know what's going to go in there. And we always say, I need 200 amps. And we get it because that's like the next size up is a 200 amp breaker. In the end, they usually only use about 100 amps so that connected. And that is to take into account all the loads that we do not know that are going to go in there. So I'm, I can almost be 100% sure that that's where he came up from with the 200 amps. But if you would like me to speak with him and I can find out specifically what the loads are and just tell him what our limitation is and find out, I'm more than happy to speak to that particular electrical contractor just to see if there's something I haven't thought of because it, it, there's always you know something. We don't all know everything. I think the issue is that uh, it hasn't been designed, it hasn't been whatever, and we're still running into obstacles on whether we can or can't build it. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our thing is that, and, and this is my question to the architects, uh, you've given us a cost on what it would be for 400 amp, and that's three phase, right? Correct, and that's just a guess. Right now, the market's so volatile, it could be right. even more which than is, that. Okay. Which is a whole lot of money. Yeah. Okay. My question is this. If we decided to go to the 400 amp, is that going to delay progress on the pier? I mean, we would have to ask with the contractor on how they wanted to do that. Um, I mean, I couldn't say what that affects. But 400 amp is three phase, right? You can get it in single phase or three phase. If right now I was just proposing taking a hundred amp single phase down to the end of the pier, um, it could be a hundred amp. Can three you take phase. a two hundred amp single phase? I can. I mean, I would have. I would have to still come from the transformer. And as far as schedule, that is something we would have to coordinate with the contractor to see how that affects their schedule on getting it down there. So what you're saying is the hundred amp you could you could find that in what you have already. And, and work with it. But if you want to go to the 200 amp, you're going to have to redesign and put a new box and Correct. Run, run from the generator. And or come whatever. from, yeah, come from the pad mount transformer and up the pier and everything. Okay. But, but, I'm sorry, but she did say that you could do the 140, 150. Yeah, I, right. I believe it's, right. yeah, right about that. Is, is that well, maxed out? Is that maxed out though? After you, if you send 150 amps out there, is that maxed out the panel box? The calculated load of the panel box, yes. So, in other words, we couldn't, without doing anything else, we're going to have to go back. If we come back and wanted more power at a later date, we're going to have to go back to the box anyway. You're going to have to go back to the transformer, yes. yes. Now, now, you've told us that it's going to be over $100,000 to go to the 400 amps, right? So, so uh, that's well, I, and that's just a guess, and uh -huh. I understand that. But my question is, uh, what's the difference if, if, all of a sudden we, we put 100 amps out there and then we find out that we can build and we can do whatever and we need 400 amps. To do that later, what's the difference in the cost going to be? Yeah, see, those are a lot of things that I, I mean, I, well, I, mean, I don't have You can have ballpark it. I mean, is it going to be the same amount or is it going to no, be doing it Doing more? it after the fact definitely is going to be more money. Um, just because now you got to bring the contractors out they got to set up they got to do you know they got to include all that in their in their dollar amount then whereas now they're already there so uh, of course it would be more expensive later on my question to you 400 amps at the end of the pier and that small of a square footage that building is going to probably have to be four stories high to use 400 amps Can we, I, uh, I understand that you know, so you know, unless you can tell me, 
from who the vendors you've talked to, if you could tell me those people of why they're saying that, they're they're probably estimating twice as amount of what they actually are going to use. And, and and like I said, I'm more than happy to put it out there, but it is an enormous amount of money to spend that will probably never get used. So, is, is there a significant difference between saying we have 150 at the end of the pier versus 200 at the end of the pier? Um, well, yeah, the difference is, is I would have to, because of my calculated load, bring in a new service from the transformer. Well, I, I think just for, you know, evaluation purposes so that, you know, the peer committee can make their recommendation to council for a vote, we need to know what is the impact of, you know, what can we do now and understand that that maximizes the load. There's nothing available for the future. What do we do now to leave a little cushion for the future? And what do we do, you know, to go whole hog and say, you know, we can do anything we want from now on. Um, and know what those alternatives are, what the impact to the project is, both financial and time, so that the peer committee can say, I think we're good for the future at this level, and here's the impact, make that recommendation so council can vote. I mean, right now what we're looking for is the definitive information. If we do this, it's X dollars in time. You know, mm -hmm. say that's say that's 100. If it's 150, it's X dollars in time. If it's 200, it's X dollars in time. And if we go crazy and it's 400 X dollars in time. You know, without that information, the peer committee can't evaluate needs and make a recommendation of what's best for the town going forward. So I mean, the only thing I can say we could do is we can write a narrative for a contractor to price. I think that's what we've been waiting that's for. That's what we've been waiting for, yeah. So let me just make sure we're clear, and it's mildly redundant. Similar grid approach. Current 150, 200, 400. Price, time. That way we could look at it and say, right, so I appreciate the, the op-ed on what might be needed for power, but we also have the other side of it from business owners, and we've got a multitude of kiosks, and we've seen and heard of large scale events that have occurred at other peers and where they've actually had blackouts and things like that. So the peak use could be defined differently than what you're thinking and laid out on there. So I think if we had a grid and you would need to work with the contractor that laid out the price, we can then work through perhaps the creative side of funding, whether it be selling memorial plaques or what have you, and be in a position to recommend. Because right now we're conflating cost with potential use with regulations and i think inside of that we should also look at corrosive resistant sealed drop down receptacles that could be housed above base flood elevation plus three feet we've got a call coming up that you're working on with yeah. fema and ocrm where we've got some specific nuance questions that we'll be able to say okay that's the yes or no from the authorities of what we can and can't do here is the price on the people who are actually building and planning this and then put them together and package them our recommendation for council to make a decision so it, it, let's stay away from the, the opinion part of it and which i appreciate i don't mean it that sounded worse than i meant it but let's just get into like the one sheet overview of here's the power current 150 200 400 here's the estimated price tag and let these bodies work on which of those makes the most sense or is feasible, but that's possible. It'll get you out of the business of trying to figure out what business is going to go in there and how many heaters are they going to have in January and that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll help on that end. But Does that make all, sense? We also want this to be done as soon as possible without delay because everybody knows what happens with ongoing delays, delays, delays. So well, we've make, got make this happen quickly. We've got business owners that say it's more viable for me to be underneath the pier and I'm going to need for my dipping dots container to have, you know, power and I'm willing to pay for that spot, which will help pay for the pier, right? So it's this circular thing. We're called in. We just need to stop it and say, 
here's what's available definitively, yes or no, from a price and regulation standpoint. Yes, but I want these people to know that it's you know, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, don't, now, it don't need to be a. It don't need to be a six month. The hundred and forty that you're talking about running down it. When you run that, is that separate from the ten receptacles? You know the ten receptacles that are there right now that that were proposed to be in there. Is that are they all linked together? Um, I don't know how many receptacles I have down along the pier. That with the three circuits, that's all right now on the job. But that's that's is that part of the 140 or whatever that you're thinking of putting down there? Oh, when I'm saying an overall price, yeah, that's. 10 receptacles, but I, I, it, that would be the next question of how is it going to be distributed? And that's where the 10 receptacles came into play. Um, if you have a 400 amp service, putting in 10 receptacles, that's not even putting in a dent to the 400 amp. So that would be the next conversation of how far are you distributing it? Or is it going to just be a single point connection down there? Yeah, so I want to jump back to, uh, we were talking about the retractable power cords underneath. Uh, when I read the state code, it specified that a surge, protect, a surge protector with a circuit breaker, or however you state, um, is allowed for permanent use. And I understand the corrosiveness of the bottom of the pier, but I mean, uh, a surge protector is probably pretty cheap. We could probably change out every 90 days if we had to and still get our money back from that. So. What is your thoughts on that? And are we saying the surge protector is just used for interior use and for permanent wiring, or would it be allowed outside of the exterior? Folks, this this uh, this code situation here is not that that anyone is trying to prohibit any of these uses. It is truly this pier has been a five or six year project of getting this thing up and going. The fire code, the building code, the mechanical code are all minimals. That they, they are all the minimal standard that we have. Uh, they they are all projected as to where anything that's in that code, somebody has either been severely injured, hurt, and or killed for that code to be in there. That's that's the reason that it's in there. We're we're dealing with many unknown situations of a, an ocean that, that fluctuates with the tide, it moves in, no one can predict how high or how low it's going to go. The code does prohibit attachment of drop cords and extension cords to a device. Um, the other thing that we have of a concern is having those cords that are lowered down on a daily basis and the weight of those cords, the, 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 uh, the code prohibits uh, drop cords because of environmental impact, be because of impact that happens to them, the wear and tear of that cord. It's like having a drop cord ran under a piece of carpet and you step on it day in and day out for, for two or three years, you eventually impact those wires so you will have a failure of those wires. And the same thing happens to these electrical, uh, temporary electrical devices on this pier you're, you're going to have impact to them on a daily basis. You're pulling them down into a sandy environment. The cords are going to get sand inside them. They're going to be unplugged. They're going to go back up. It's, it's going to rain. You're going to have customers coming up that are soaking wet from, from being in the ocean, being in the water, that's going to come up to be served in these uh, environments. So as the code is, it would prohibit the use of drop cords inside this building in a controlled environment. So it certainly would prohibit the use of drop cords in a very hazardous, corrosive atmosphere in an outside environment. Uh, the code does have some provisions of if you are using drop cords on the outside, that they certainly would be outdoor use drop cords and UL listed for that use. Does that help? You're welcome. It doesn't help me. I'm confused. I'm sorry. So we can throw an extension cord over the side of the pier for four hours for an event. No, you can't. Drop cords are not permitted at any time. At any, at any time. We can't have any, any use of power under the pier for any purpose for any amount of time, period. Nothing. Drop, 
drop cords by the state fire code are not permitted. Um, An extension cord can't extension be dropped. Extension cord. It has to be a, a, a um, Permanently wired. A surge strip. A surge strip can be plugged into an outlet. Uh, you can't plug surge strip into surge strip, but a surge strip could be plugged into one outlet. But it would have to be a UL listed um, drop cord or surge strip for that that device that was was listed for that. So I could I could drop a surge strip UL extension cord with a surge protector that was UL listed off the side of the pier to power a speaker for a surf competition or a, a fishing competition that we're having. So a surge strip is kind of different from GFCI. Yeah. Surge strip is going to protect you from lightning and those kind of things. And we have surge protection on the main service that's coming in. So if something hits our main service, that surge will protect it. GFCI is, I think, more of what we're talking, which is the ground faults or, you know, what you have in your bathroom so that if you're with water and you plug in, it's going to pop. I'm asking so. specifically one of the, the potential business owners that we're working with conducts a lot of community events, stuff for kids like the crab races to fishing and, and a lot of things that will be very family beach oriented. And some of that will take place on the beach and some of that will require some power. So if I'm hearing you correctly, we're limited to carrying a 12 volt car battery down on the beach and running off of that rather than throwing some type of power down. Well, throwing some type of power down is going to make for a very hazardous environment that would not be approved by the code. Thank you. You're welcome. Just, just a question as you, to the fear committee, as you've gone and you've looked at other peers, have they dealt with the situation in a similar manner? Uh, we, quite, I'm sorry, I'm running out of here too. No, no, uh, no the kiosk under the pier. Microphone, uh, microphone, that was on the, oh, yeah. <laughs> the kiosk under the pier was uh, our own idea, really. I don't think well, was that at, a flash at, of inspiration. There was, uh, but, at Folly Beach, there is a, right. they have a blender and a, and a bar set up which is at the same elevation as the sand of what we're talking about, kind of the elevation of where the elevator shaft is. Um, they have that down there. They did have power strips down there uh, under kind of where that kid slipped and fell. Yeah. Uh, they did have power down there. I'm not sure it was grandfathered in or not, but it, it seems that our interpretation right here and now for this pier is very different than some of the things that we've seen, which is why we're pressing. We're not trying to be disrespectful of anything, but like we're leaning forward into this going, yeah, this, I think it's a great idea, yeah. but <laughs> can, I, can I just one thing, just what you got to remember of Folly Beach and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mayor, or the, all of you all that were there with me is Folly Beach where that stuff is, it's concrete underneath, right? I was actually sand where the, uh, where the blender was okay. I, and, and it was, that's why I was it was outside of the dune line, right? I'm, and at a similar elevation. So it didn't seem to be like what we're, match up with what yeah. we're talking about so that wouldn't you know that wouldn't be like a code item I don't know. It, it, which is why i'd love for us to get just ask some of these specific questions with ocrm and fema and just yeah and, and we're in the process of, we're in the process of, of setting that up I, I mean the only thing i have right now is the email they sent me that i sent to y'all cool. i appreciate we can't do it but um well i i think we're setting it up all of those answers like whether it's yeah or nay it, it's almost secondary to what would it cost, right? Theoretically, if we were able to do it, what would that marine environment sealed plug when you're done using it, seal it up, retracts, salt water resistant, stainless steel, X, Y, and Z, retractable uh, power cost, right? So we know the cost, which is different than can or does it fit into our code versus it OCRM versus as a FEMA, and then have the, those appropriate discussions. So that, that doesn't, for the purpose of this meeting, it's let's get cost of these things, and, and if we're able to do it, that'll be secondary. Alex, from what I'm hearing from what the chief says, it's he's saying that there are going to be no power limited to none under the fear. No way, I mean, whatever you say, he's not going to approve, or the ordinance is not going to approve no power under the pier. 
And if I'm wrong with that, maybe he can explain it. But that's what I'm hearing from you. It's no matter what y'all are asking for, they ain't going to prove no power under the pier. So any kiosk or anybody else under there is not going to be able to have no power. The the code the code is South Carolina Fire Code Section 604.5, extension cords. Extension cords and flexible cords shall not be a substitute for permanent wiring. Wiring uh, and shall be listed and labeled accordance with UL 817. Extension cords and flexible cords shall not be affixed to structures extended through walls, ceilings, floors, or doors. Uh, shall not be uh, subject to environmental or physical impact. Cords shall only be used for portable appliances and shall be marked for indoor use and shall, shall not be used outdoors. So when, when we look at it, the environmental impact of this cord the, the cord is, is going to be subject, subjected to environmental impact of being pulled down, stepped on, walked on. Uh, again, it's in the sand. It's going to be plugged, unplugged, a water environment, a corrosive environment. By my interpretation of the code, I cannot see where all of these can be mitigated and we don't have this issue of at least one of those in this situation that we're having. And again, I'm trying to look after the life safety, the, the town's liability limits. I, the last thing I want to see is somebody be shot, uh, to be uh, electrocuted, to be injured. And, and it, is, it is just an uncontrolled environment that's there. And we're also looking at something, folks, we're not looking at most likely on kioshes of, of where there is a hugely responsible adult there. In most cases, it's going to be someone there running that kiosk that comes in every day that it's going to be a student worker, somebody that maybe does not have the, the education, uh, the, the knowledge of, of the, the dangers of electricity. And so therefore, I think it's a huge risk to have that person pulling that cord down, plugging it in, uh, and the hazards of that on a daily basis. So, uh, Keith, if, if I'm understanding correctly, let me let me shift a little bit with how you're saying it and let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. So it is possible to have, you know, the marine grade sealed whatever outlet under the pier. But the issue is the wear and tear of the movement of the cord. If, if we have permanent wiring, why, why yeah, all of it's permanently wired in. The only thing that moves is the outlet itself. Sabrina? Yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to make it clear. FEMA and our town ordinance says all you can only have one receptacle, which we have in our in the, uh, elevator now. Every other electrical outlet has to be three feet above the lowest horizontal member on the pier. Can't have anything else okay, there. so you can't have anything under the podium. No. Okay. So if it's stored up there and pulled down, that's not. As there. long as as the source is three foot above the lowest horizontal member, it meets our requirements. It does not meet fire requirements. Okay, and, it, and I've heard drop cords and, and extension cords. That it started with extension cords. They're treated the same, or, or you know, retractable, which. I'm assuming is what you mean by drop cord. Uh, uh, something if it's plugged into if it's plugged into an outlet, and it is it is pulled down. That is is technically by code going to be interpreted as a drop cord. It's a it's a temporary it's device. Cord. It's it's not a permanent device. It's not attached to the structure as permanent wiring would be attached to the structure. Yeah. Did I say that well, correctly? Yeah. Are you talking about when you said he's retractable? Thanks, humans. Are you talking about? actually having that assembly hardwired into a sealed unit yes. or plugging it into up, it. Up here, yeah. Pull it down. No. And then you got a right. The only place you're going to plug something up is on the end of the retractable right. at the bottom. And where it comes up at the top above your three feet will be hardwired in. Correct. So it'll be all one unit yeah. in a sealed unit. Would that solve your problem? It it's not a, it wouldn't be a drop cord then in a way. It, it still 
it's still that cord is going to come down every day and still be subjected to wear, to wear and tear and, and physical impact, and then it's going to be put down in the sand, in the water. It won't be in the oh. sand. It won't come all the way yeah, down. We it tell it can only be that, yeah. Put a stop it only needs to come down five feet. I mean, that needs to be five feet above the sand. Right. But then we've, we've got the weight of those two cords going together, and when somebody steps on it, it's going to come unplugged every time we, we step on it. By, it I, I'm not trying to I understand, and I, I think it's a wonderful idea, but I just I cannot see how we can make this safe with that cord coming down. If we've got two cords coming together that's up in the air and then somebody steps on it, leans on it, or whatever, it's going to constantly be pulled apart and then that cord falls down into the sand and we've still got the, the situation of where come people coming up to be served in wet bathing suits and touching and stepping on things, uh, cords that even from the, the device, uh, I, I see this all the time in, in doing inspections of where cords of where they're, they're uh, on devices that move, carts that move, and the, the wheels roll over them, and those cords are not inspected on a daily basis, and that cord ends up where the insulation gets broken on it, and then we've got an exposed wire, and somebody steps on that exposed wire. There, there is just a multitude of, of high-hazard electrical shock devices that, that can happen in having these uh, mobile devices underneath the pier. Well, I guess from our point of view, we understand there's there's hazards and risk and, and that's good, but we're trying to understand code versus those other considerations. So that's what we've been coming from. So I mean that's all for you guys to take in and, and us to take in. Well could so, not could that not be put on the GFI circuit? Do if you, if it's ground I mean if you had a ground fault it it knock it out just like that instead of having it live wired all the time. I mean have well, it Well it it would be on a GFI circuit, but it still doesn't comply with that. I mean, there's the codes, but then there's the authority having jurisdiction, and he's the authority. So whatever is in the code, he can override it, or, you know, anybody else on that safety Well, spectrum. I'm still asking, well, he's saying that it can't be there, and all, what they're trying to get at, is, and he keeps saying they're a hazard of, of, a, of electrical shock, or, or... Even if it's a GFI, you still have hazards. Probably the GFI will trip if the insulation gets compromised but then there's always something that comes it, it could be plugged in wrong or maybe it didn't trip until somebody steps on it and then it trips after they get shocked and the, you know so there's so many things with that of why the extension cord <laughs> has come along and i just i just wanted to clarify when you read that about uh drop cords extension cords it was only interior, correct? There was no outdoor use. listed use, correct? Correct. So even by that, we're beyond, and then we're into the corrosive environment, correct? Yes. Go ahead. Let's just, just address one thing which no one really talks about is the corrosive Microphone. Well, I'll speak to the microphone, uh, which is something I have experience with in maintaining the preview here. We have three quarter inch galvanized bolts brought down to smaller than a pencil over a period of 20 or 30 years. No matter what kind of electrical we wind up with on the pier, it's going to need a lot of maintenance. I've seen junction boxes, sealed rubber gasket, junction, box, uh, junction boxes with the wires melted inside from that salt environment. So the more, uh, more we put there, it's going to, it has an opportunity to corrode, it's going to corrode. Because again, we had we, we, we paid money in 2015 and 2014. We had to have every joist hanger and every connection underneath the two buildings that were there, surf diner and pier operators, had to be reinforced and redone. We had to plate everything with new stainless steel one inch thick plates because the building the building we had a structural engineer look at it and they had all routed away beyond their useful life. So just just keep that in mind, anybody who's making decisions, whether it be the committee or the, the council, that it, the corrosion is a real factor on this pier, and it's going to need a lot of maintenance uh, no matter what you decide to do. I keep hearing the same answer, that if we have kiosk vendors that need power, they need to locate themselves on top of the pier. Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. I keep hearing and, that same answer. 
Mr. Mayor, back to the fire marshal. You mentioned on the generator, the gasoline concern. Well, no, they got propane generators too. So propane would be a sealed unit and a sealed line, and they run those inside businesses all the time. Food line, Walmart, cleaning the floors while people are shopping and everything. There's no pollution, which you're concerned with, no spillage. Would that be suffice? Because they got those quiet generators, they're not noisy, and a portable propane tank with it. They got a holders for them and everything. I'm trying to get somebody that needs a little bit of power for the purpose of solving everybody's problem here today. Councilman Drake, and I, I am not trying to be the, the, the person that just prohibits every, everything that happens. I, I do have a concern with LP. LP is a, is a gas that's heavier than air. Yeah. It's one and a half times heavier than air. So it's going to go down to the ground and seek out an ignition, ignition source. If we were to have, let's just say, a leak there um, from, a, from a propane tank that uh, was improperly connected that day and that LP gas leaked and somebody was smoking or we unplugged an outlet or we, there was an electrical spark arc or some, some type of situation, we would have that potential fire. All that LP could possibly be trapped under the pier and we could have the risk of that explosion. I don't know what size tanks we're looking at, but like a gas grill. That's yeah, what, that's what, twenty pound. 20 yeah, pounds. that's all. They're that, simple twenty pound can cylinders, and they got holders on the side of those um, generators that, for them. That is is still a huge amount of propane to be used there if it's moved in and out. And again, that hose is is moved and transferred on on a daily basis. Now, when we look at, um, I, I'll I'll reference this back to something. And folks, I, I do want you to understand the codes do change as, as mobile food trucks. Uh, and, and that kind of goes back to the propane. 20 years ago, mobile food trucks was not in the code. Today, the, the code, because of the use of mobile food trucks, and we've had so many explosions from use of mobile food trucks of, of where we've had huge catastrophic events of where uh, they, they exploded. Today, it is mandated that mobile food trucks have to be inspected on a yearly basis for all those hoses and connections to make sure that, that those hoses have not, because of transport up and down the road, that those hoses have not worn and, and had a leak. So when, when we're looking at permitting that, certainly I would have to look into the code as, as far as, as what, what would be permitted uh, on that, but certainly it would definitely require uh, some some extensive inspection of a third party agency to look at those hoses and connections uh, to make sure that, that they were secure and that we didn't have an accidental leak in that situation. Um, propane is, is a very volatile um, explosive gas and, and it certainly poses poses a problem also with that and, and being it's not going to go up into the atmosphere and dissipate it is heavier than air and it, it is it is going to seek out an ignition source on the ground so that is would be my concern with with propane sir well i mr mayor i think it what we're looking for is is a is a compromise something right something that we can help these guys get this and not just say no you know that's that's where Every time we have something in town, not just necessarily this, this is the answer we give anybody. No. Try to help find a solution of trying to fix the problem. And, and maybe somewhere these people, you, somebody can come up with a, with a thing and tell them this is what we can do. Maybe we could, we could help do this or just instead of saying, no, we ain't going to do that. You're right, Chris. But I, I think... I think Alex had the solution there, and what they've requested previously is to get a meeting with OCRM or FEMA or whomever the regulatory body is, you know, whether that's state, you know, and I'm sure Keith would be involved in the meeting. Get that meeting together of those subject matter experts and talk through it what, what is and isn't possible. Yeah. And I, I think that's what, you know, the peer committee has already requested. It's just a matter you know, when's that going to actually happen? Okay. That's where I'm coming from. Call OCRM. We'll, uh, hopefully get with them today. And then we'll figure out. 
I mean, that'll, that'll, you knowing knowing them the way that you know them and you know them better than anybody else, are they going to be willing to come here and talk to us? I just probably get a phone call with Bill, with the gentleman in Charleston who handles all all critical area permitting for the state. Uh, his name is Matt Slagle. Uh, he has uh, in an email, uh, I've, I've sent a uh, proposal in there. What, what do you think about this? Uh, when we built up here, don't forget before. I'm sorry. Before Hurricane Matthew ever happened, we had permitted the three, the third building on the pier, and we had done that with the foresight of how can we maximize the revenue that the pier can bring in. That was a decision by a previous council and a previous administrator, et cetera. And so we went to OCRM at the time, uh, and we had amended our permit with the state prior to Hurricane Matthew to add that third building and to expand Surf Diner. The, the 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 qualifying thing was that you're only allowed 35 percent of the total footprint of the pier for amenity structures, and we made sure we maxed that out to the, basically the square foot at the time when we amended our pier permit. So what's been designed and is being built right now is the maximum that the state allows for amenity structures on this pier. To add anything else at the end of the pier. Uh, I've been told in a recent uh, email conversation with uh, Mr. Slagle would not be permitted since we've already maxed out our 35 percent. Is that is that sort of like the uh, substantial improvement that we have on the on the other where it's where it's 48 percent every five years? Is this 31 no, percent every five years? No, it's period and forever. The 48 percent is FEMA has with their NFIP rules that substantial improvement because they want you to elevate that structure. So they're going to limit how much renovation you can do to it. This is for this is their rule on, on oceanfront piers. The second hurdle would be they also have another rule stating that you can't build any sort of a structure more than halfway out on the existing pier. So to build something on the pier of what is being proposed and talked about, you'd have to overcome two different state regulations. Uh, to get there, uh, and, 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 and if you were to get there, then uh, there's other challenges with FEMA insurability, because we're required to have uh, insurance on our town-owned buildings, and the FEMA regulations state that they, that they will not issue flood insurance to anything that's over water, any structure over water. So if you build a building at the end of the pier, uh, even, if you, even if you were to overcome the two state rules that you have in front of you, you won't be able to overcome the FEMA rule. And we have documentation for all of this. So uh, I'm more than willing to go through the exercise with everybody. Uh, I don't want to st stomp on anybody's uh, ideas, but this, these are significant issues. I have a question about that, John. Um, the, rigid, the plan that we have now already has a structure on the end of the pier. We're not trying to add a structure on the end of the pier. There's already one on there. It's on the plan. The shade structure right there is not considered an amenity. Ah. It's an open air. It's got uh, 15 posts only enough, something like that, 12 or 15 posts. It's just meant for, for shade. That's all it is. Also excluded, also excluded from the amenity structures is any uh, handicapped access and bathroom. That's not counted in the 35%. Uh, and also but, observation decks are also excluded. Right. Right. No, no. Observations are included. No. It's in there. Is it? Oh. It's in the, it says, um, it says something. excluding restrooms, handicapped access features, and observation Okay, decks. they occupy no more than 35% of the total thing. So, so what, we're not so, trying to add anything to the pier. We're just trying to modify what's already on the plans at the end of the pier. I want to make that clear. Uh, well, I, I, the, 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 well, we've talked about an observation deck on top of that, still open air, and the sunshade would be, a, you know, you're just really taking it and moving, moving it up. up eight feet. So no, no change in uh, square footage, not making it a yeah. structure, not okay. a look. We can clarify all these questions in a, yeah. in a further phone call with OCR. These, right. these are the things we've been looking yes. for. Yes. yes. Because Thank you. the biggest part of the pier I see that, that everybody has wanted in this pier is family oriented, something for kids to go to, people to enjoy, and especially when 
when I was campaigning, was people wanted to be able to hear beach music. They want to hear, like Garden City has the karaoke, and you can just hang out and have a good time. Well, there's nowhere on our pier at this point in time an outdoor area other than Surf Diner, and he's already got all that. So we got to put something down there to do that, or we're going to have a pier it's going to be nothing to do. Nobody wants to go through this. Right. Pool, it's a fishing pier. It's a fish, and, and that, that's not going to cover that. that. That's not going to cover the expense. But, so it's got to be a fun place to go to. But the, the way Garden City gets around that is that structure that's out at the end of the pier has yeah. wheels. is on wheels. Well, we may it have is, to get us some pretty wheels. wheels. But it's and wheels. an amenity. Yeah, we may have to get us some pretty move. wheels in. I asked, I asked OCRM about that as well uh, because it was brought to my attention, and, and he said that there was some sort of thing from the early 90s about that. He reiterated anything today right. to comply right. with the regulations, so he right. kind of pushed that right to the side. Well, but regulations right. can change too. So. Yeah, well, that's But it's just something we need to really look at, and we yeah. say no, we say no, we say no, like Chris was talking about. We need to stop and look at it because all this effort would be worthless what we're going through if nobody comes to it. And, and if you don't have some type of a atmosphere where people enjoy going to it, everybody's not going to eat dinner every day. So. It'll, it'll be good for about three weeks. Yeah. Everybody will come for three weeks, then a year later we won't have nobody. Right. So it's got to be something musical, fun, something going on, top, bottom, everywhere. And I Folks, I, I hope every one of you understands that, that it is not my um, desire to come and say no every time. I, I certainly want to work with everybody and, and make anything possible that can be done in a safe environment. However, I do think that, that I am sworn to make sure that our decisions that we make are code compliant, um, code um, workable, and, and certainly to make for a safe environment for all to come and enjoy. But the last thing we all want to ever see any of us, none of us want to see somebody get hurt. But then the last thing we want to see is the news media, the, um, the, the, uh, the media, that, the coverage that we get from an accident that we can prevent. And, and that's what I'm certainly trying to look at here is any safety hazard is, is mitigating that before we have it so that we don't have any unfortunate injuries or accidents on the pier and get that ne negative impact. And, and that certainly is my, my uh, concern. Now, as, as far as other ideas, I do not have any uh, opposition at all to having vendors under the pier. Uh, if, if they want to have snow cones or ices and, and bring that material in, put them in some kind of cooler environment, maybe they have to put it in there a couple of times a day. But we're, we're not trying to permit or prohibit having vendors under the pier. They certainly can be there. It's just that power and electricity, because of the hazard and the nature of that, is, is a, a problem and, and a concern that we have. It's not that we're trying to permit prohibit vendors being under there. And, and the last thing I do want to mention is, is we are talking about an elevated structure, an observation deck. There is another concern there. And again, folks, I, I'm, I just want to make you up front to it, is if, if we have a, a, that type of device built and it is over a certain square footage of 50 occupants, it would be required to have two means of egress off of it. So, I mean, there's, there's some other issues to having observation platforms. And I, I just wanted to make you aware of that as, as we start discussing that issue. Thank you. Keith, I'm not, I'm not jumping on you. Believe me. <laughs> What I'm just saying is we need to look at all options. Yes. And I and I hope that's what you're doing. If you come in here and tell us no, listen, I believe you. I'll I'll work with you on no, but look at all options to what we can do to get to that point, maybe. If if it's not possible, it's not possible. Believe me. I've I'm not uh jumping on anybody for doing their job. I want you to do your job. That's what we hire you to do, and that's that's, I'll stand behind you on what you do, but if there are an option, if there's something we can do to help these people get to that point, I sure would like to have it. I, and I understand that, sir. I, I understand entertainment and fun, and, and I want I want it to be a fun environment, but I also want everybody to go home safe. That that's my Amen. goal, and, and I 
I'll work with anybody, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, let's recap on what we're talking about. Uh, we said that we, we asked you guys if you would do us a cost and time for the uh, 100 amp, 200 amp, and 400 amp. Correct. And, and just... 100, 150, 200, and 400 amp. Okay. For time and schedule. How long do you think it would take to get that? Um, and I'm not trying to rush you. I'm just trying to work our schedule. So that we yeah, we are trying to rush you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to clarify that one for you. We'll be here until 5. Well, <laughs> Did you not bring it today? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll just clarify that, that we would write the narrative for then the contractor to price those things out with their subcontractors. We'll handle the contractor. We'll get him to get it. <laughs> you just get y'all's part and then we'll get them. I mean, we're not we're not looking for exact costs at this point because we're not we haven't picked one, but we're looking at ballparks so that we know the difference. If there's a dramatic difference between one or the other, I think that we should know that. One of my other questions is, it sounds like where you're wanting to put the kiosk is more towards the parking lot end of the building. So really, yeah. you're only wanting to take half that power down to the end of the pier and the other half of that power you want available at the other at the front end. Is mm -mm. that what I'm well, hearing? Mm -mm. We, no. The no. first part okay. of the pier is only 16 feet wide. There's not really room for kiosks on top. When it goes out to the 24, that's where we figure there's some room on the pier. And there won't be but we also room. wanted to have them underneath, you know. But well, I asked that because, I mean, if, if you're not saying under the pier, maybe the parking lot is where you can have kiosks, and that could be a different scenario. Oh, yes. And that would mean if only half the power is at the transformer location, you're not talking about taking 400 amps really down to the end of the pier because you're talking about half that power to be at the, the front end, which is not as long of a feed. The 400 amps, they were talking about the end of the pier. Okay. And 400 amps is Because the people that are running the kiosk maybe run a cash register, maybe a somewhere that blender. Is okay. More realistic. Mr. Okay. Mayor, I, I'd like, I guess, Bill to get the vendor's contractor, electrical contractor, talk to Lisa to make sure that he didn't just throw out a number without having facts behind it. Because that's that's what driving a lot of this is what the vendor said he wanted. And, and the vendor told us yesterday when we met with them that uh, they used Donnie Stewart to do their to do their electrical and that's Donnie Stewart is the person that basically told them you know what amperage they needed so I mean if you guys would talk to him maybe he has a different yeah I don't know him. I'll, I'll, Bill can you arrange I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the actual vendor because they work for him and not for us correct yeah right but I, I really think it, it would help if she had direct contact with, the, with yes. his, the vendor's electrical contractor. See, it all boils down to we're trying to please the, the, the merchant that's going, maybe going in there and potential. Well, I know else. they come to you and they say, I'll lease your property if you have 200 amps available to me. And you go, I only have 150. Right. Well, it'd be nice to know why he wants 200 amps. And, but and keep in mind, the person that, answer. the person that we talked to, I told you Donnie Stewart, right? Donnie Stewart is, is the general contractor. He's not the electrician for the general contractor, okay. right? So, and he's not an electrician himself. So basically what he did is talk to his electrician and that's where he got his. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's third per party information. Well, it's just like me saying it's going to cost you $50,000. Absolutely. You know, I mean, we kind of have ballpark numbers to use to start with, to start the conversation. Yeah. So. And it may be that we find that because there is a threshold of what you have currently. And so beyond that threshold is a factor of X. And so it may just be that you say, all right, well, we're either willing to run an additional service from the main source, or we're going to live within our means. And, you know, that's, we've got a cap on that. So there may not be four options. There's probably two. Yeah. What so we have or more. Right. Yeah. That's what right. I think we're looking at. So through right. this narrative, we should be able to get the answer. 
I think we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Does Does anybody on council have any further questions? Mr. Mayor, I I don't really have a question, but it kind of is. It's directed towards the electrical engineer. Um, let's say after we get up and running, and we find out that the surf diner is only using 275 amps of power at their peak. Mm -hmm. It it's not a huge thing to go in and reconfigure and channel that somewhere else, is it? At, at that point, when the uh, engineer drawings would get done, they would get a peak demand off the service. Right. And when that peak demand, and they're going to look at the whole service, the 1200 amps. And when it comes back and says, oh, at your peak, you're only using 500 amps, then that engineer can use the 500 amps. They add 125% to that for ups and downs. And then the rest of that is considered spare capacity. So now they can actually design and use that for something else. Okay, thank you. So then the calculated load doesn't count as much. Go ahead. I'd just like to thank y'all for coming in today and the peer committee for being here today. I think it's great we got this kind of communication. And thank you for your electrical numbers. It, it's different from what I thought, too. So thank you. <laughs> And does what does the peer committee have to say? Well, I, I microphone. Think, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> they want a retract, yeah. retractable. Question. No, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I know we've asked some of these questions for weeks and even a couple of months, so it's good to get everybody at one time, all you know, hearing and, and relative back to the codes because we're trying to stay within the codes and even beyond. I mean, good to have the the safety considerations that are you know beyond what we've been talking so far. So yeah, we've still got a lot of thinking to do and working around. We still want to make it uh, as as interesting and entertaining as possible, but it's all good input. And again, I appreciate everybody's time. Well, that, Bill, do you have anything to say? I myself, I appreciate everybody coming too. Yeah, thank you. And and again, I, I'm gonna copy Keith this is all about life safety uh, you know some of the stuff we talk about is a one in a billion chance of ever happening but then if you look at the history of beaches over the last couple of years we've had those one in a billion chance and we've suffered because of it because we've lost people we want to make sure we do the right thing and keep everybody safe mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that, I appreciate everybody coming tonight. And your presentation was was really good. That we learned more about electricity well, than we knew. Yeah. More than you ever wanted to know, here. I'm yeah. sure. No, that's fine. So with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.